Ladies and gentlemen, the workhorse from Whitehorse, the other one, Randy Hahn joins us on the program. Randy, congratulations on 2000. Now, refresh our memories. Were you there right in 91, 92? Have you been a lifer for 30 years? I have, Cools, and it's great to be on with you and, and Rupper as well. And I'm a big fan of the program. As the, as the late, great Dick Clark would occasionally say, it's number one with a bullet. But, uh, yes, 1991-92 season, I was there. Uh, that's when I actually broke in uh, as the backup to Joe Starkey, who had the famous uh, The Band is on the Field Cal football call. He was the original TV voice for the Sharks, but I filled in for him the first two years for about a total of 30 games. And uh, But my first ever game, Ruffer, was in New Jersey on October 26th of 1991. Final score, 9 nothing Devils. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. Nine nothing. It, it, the Devils. Hey, you're talking back in that time. Nine goals. That's like that's like eleven games played for them. Usually. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, first star Claude Lemieux. Second star Chris Terreri. They would both go on to become Sharks. Third star Tom Chorsky. Link Gates. Thirty six minutes in penalties, including a double <laughs> game misconduct. And I don't know. Do we still have double game misconducts? Cool. You you know the rules. Uh, we do, but uh, nobody hits anymore, so you don't even get a game misconduct. So I don't know if we're going to ever see a double game misconduct again, Randy. Uh, I appreciate the, the kind words, and it's great having you on. Love your call, uh, and I've loved you before I knew you too. So I love the history, uh, and 30 years is a long time ago. And I know the trip to the finals and everything else, but since we're talking history of the Sharks, was the 06 the best opportunity? I don't want to, you know, bring any bad memories. Game three in Edmonton? Like, was that the meal, Banya? Like, was that it? Game three, overtime. If they score that goal, do they win the cup and beat Carolina, Randy? Maybe they do. There was a lot of controversy about that series. Uh, I believe uh, Milan Mahalik was knocked out of the series in uh, game two by future shark Rafi Torres. Um, and uh, there was, there was so many opportunities in that series. Uh, you know, it was a little bit of criticism of Ron Wilson at the time that he didn't dress uh, Doug Murray uh, following that hit. Uh, and Ron went with the most more skillful lineup for us to the series, but uh, that's history. Of course they went to the cup in 16, but uh, I'm not sure that they were going to be able to skate with that Pittsburgh team. And by the way, great to follow up the great, uh, Bob Airy, former Sharks captain as well. You left that out of his resume. That's right. That is right. I forgot about that. Uh, Bobby Airy, uh, uh, you know, you know what? That, there's, we're thinking back of the history here with the Sharks. There's one player, and I remember before um, we had the cools. You might be familiar. You, might, you know the prospects tournament that's like pre OHL draft. I don't know if they still have it, but it was it was held at Guelph University. And they would have the the prospects, uh, basically the major junior hopefuls to to get drafted. And so we had a, a team in that. And this was my introduction kind of to Canadian hockey. And we had uh, what ended up being quite a few first-round picks of the OHL uh, that, that went there. And I was introduced to this player that came walking in the locker room. Jonathan Chichu comes walking in. And hearing that he's from Moose Factory, Ontario, which I don't even know where that was, is far north. And he comes in and he had this shot. And when you're looking back and I, you think about, about some, some names that kind of pop out over time in San Jose, uh, he had that, he had that season. He had 56 goals. I mean, what do you remember about Jonathan Chichu? Well, what you remember most about him was when Joe Thornton got here from Boston and the, the, instant chemistry those two had and you know jumbo arguably one of if not the greatest passer in his generation and a great trigger man i mean cheech he didn't skate very well and and when the rules changed coming out of the lockout that hurt him a lot he ended up playing a lot at the end of his career over in the khl but before those rules were changed i mean he was just a trigger man and he and joe had had a remarkable connection but cheech had that you know, that love for the game and, and coming from Moose Factory, 
representing not only that town, but, you know, uh, representing a people there. And, and still to this day, he lives in San Jose. Now he's retired here, thankfully, one of the few who can afford to actually retire in the Bay Area. And it's a good thing he's here because he's a big part of the alumni. But he still goes back, still gives back to, to the community in, in uh, Moose Factory. And uh, it was, a, it was a, a, an incredible time. Uh, they came out with a great promotion back in those days, uh, a whistle uh, for the Chi Chu train whistle, and they gave it away at a Sharks <laughs> home game to all uh, 17,972 fans. And for the next uh, three years, every time he was on the ice, we would hear the Chi Chu train whistle. So uh, lots of great memories uh, from Chi Chu, and it's, uh, as I said, great to still see him uh, out on the golf course once in a while. We're with Randy Hahn, longtime face and voice of San Jose Sharks hockey, talking, of course, about uh, San Jose hockey of the past. Let's go to San Jose hockey of the present. The fans have had a lot, you know, cup final, no Stanley Cup, but almost other than the first couple of years, the Sharks got good quick. Like, you know, Kansas City Royals, good quick, and have had tremendous seasons and tremendous players. Now the retweaking and rebuild is on. What's it been like with the fan base? And is it going to still get a little worse before it gets better, Randy? What do you think? Because it's not so easy to tear down and rebuild. If it was, everyone would do it all the time, Randy. Well, first off, um, the Sharks owner, Hasso Plattner, specifically you know, went out of his way to state that the Sharks were not going to tank. Uh, he didn't believe in that approach. And I think um, extending... Tomas Hurdle to an eight-year contract was his statement of, look, we're, this is a piece we're not going to let go, and he's going to be a part of things going forward, and we're, we're not going to go that route. A rebuild, a retool, absolutely, and, and we're in the probably early stages of it, and that's unfortunate, but it is the situation. And as to the fan base, uh, as you would expect in a place where there's so much competition, not just for the pro sports dollar with two baseball teams and an NFL team and a pretty good basketball team, the Warriors, and on and on and on, not to mention the options for leisure in a place where you can go to wine country, go skiing, or go play at Pebble Beach or lay on the beach, and you could probably do all four of those in one day. So having said that, when you have a fan base that is used to playoffs, that is used to being considered a contender, now staring the possibility of four straight seasons without a playoff berth, there's been a significant drop-off in the interest. And, uh, you know, it's been tough. It's been disappointing to see a place that was packed basically for 20 years, completely sold out every night. Now that's not the case. And uh, that whole nice advantage that the Sharks had and, Rupper can even speak to this. I mean, that was a building that nobody as a visitor felt good about going into because with Jumbo out there, and he'd, he'd bag two or three points in the first period and then just say, oh, okay, boys, we're on our way. I mean, that was a tough place, and the Bokov more often than not was able to shut the door. It's not like that. It's different, and, and I think it's going to take a while to get back to that, uh, that time. Uh, and as you said, it might be a little longer than we'd all wish. Randy, it's a great point you brought up, and uh, I'm glad you brought it up because that was a nightmare place for me and a lot of my teammates to play. And a lot of times I was in the Eastern Conference, so um, you, you'd go out there and maybe there'd be times you're playing against the Sharks where you were not – there was a, a little bit of an emotional um, – you know, detachment because it was the Western Conference, but you'd go there and you just get absolutely fed of seven nothing, six two. I mean, you're hearing that deep. I could tell you, I could tell you the goal horn, that the deep. You hear it. It haunts you on the flight out of there. I mean, that place was a difficult. The Shark Tank was as hard to play as anywhere else in the league. So it's about how to get back there. And one of the great stories all year uh, has been Eric Carlson, how good he's been. I, that's a huge piece of the, the the puzzle because he's obviously performing now, but now there's garnered up interest of what used to be an unmovable contract. Maybe this could be something to help this team turn the corner faster. How do you see this kind of stuff playing out? Well, it, it's, it's uh, you know, when you put uh, pencil to paper and try and figure out how to move the contract, 
that's when it starts to become, uh, you know, difficult to imagine. But nothing is impossible, and, and things can happen in that regard. I, I think it would be a tough conversation to have with ownership um, because of the potential for significant retention of salary for somebody who, uh, you know, depending on where you move him, might come back to bite you uh, in future seasons as you try to rebuild. But uh, be that as it may, uh, at this point, Eric has pretty much deflected all talk of that. He's not getting into it. Uh, he doesn't want to address it uh, in in a very expansive way. And you may have seen him recently on Hockey Night in Canada. He didn't really want to go into it all that much. He is playing the best hockey he's played consistently uh, since he came here in that in that big trade with the Senators. Uh, he had flashes. There were a month at a time or maybe a six-week period, but those would always end with injury and, in some cases, a season-ending injury. So, there was never that connection between Eric and the fan base here when the Sharks were still contending in 18, 19, uh, and now missing the playoffs in the last three years. He no longer, you know, has uh, Patrick Marlowe or Joe Pavelski or Brent Burns or Joe Thornton. You know, those four iconic players, you could arguably put uh, three of them on the Sharks Mount Rushmore. Uh, they're not here anymore. And so, it's difficult for Eric now because he is uh, he is the core pillar of this team right now in many ways. And there are some pieces around him, like Hurdle, like Meyer, like Couture, um, and, and a few others, and hopefully some coming uh, from the American Hockey League Barracuda, but just not enough right now. And it, it's sad because the fans wanted to cheer for Eric like they are now when the team was in the hunt. A few more with Randy Hahn, face and voice of Sharks Hockey, joining us here on the Power Play. Just called his uh, 2,000th game the other night. Uh, a week ago, Sharks in action against Calgary tonight. So, Randy, uh, what was it like when you were presented with that engraved bottle of wine that was signed by the entire team? And Logan Couture, for those who don't stay up late, maybe don't hear him as much, what's, what's he like? You've seen him come in as a kid, and now he's in his early 30s. What's the, what's the plan um with the sharks captain well first of all it was an honor to be invited down to the dressing room by logan he, he urged that i got down there as soon as possible after the game and uh, as you would know cools you know as a, as a broadcaster you normally aren't right down there in fact you're never down there before the doors open for the media to come post game so this all happened before that i rushed down uh, logan was there to meet me gave a little speech we took a picture they presented me with a wine bottle and and the feeling down there and 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 rupert can appreciate this the team had just won the music was still going it was reimer's first home win so everybody was happy for him there was that buzz down there that the guys hadn't showered yet. Half of them still had their skates on. And, and it hit me after 31 years, I've never felt this energy in an NHL dressing room before. So that was as, as wonderful a part of the experience as the actual presentation, which was first class, of course, by Logan and the guys. Uh, as to Logan going forward, I don't know. I, th I think a lot of this would be between Mike Greer uh, and Logan as to whether or not Logan wanted to move on. This is the franchise that drafted him in the first round, uh, and it, he's, he's played his entire career with the Sharks and is the captain of the Sharks. Uh, if he wants to move on, I think they would try and accommodate him, uh, but I, I don't know that they want to force him out. I don't sense that at all. He brings so much leadership to a group that – you know, he's going to need new personnel and more depth and more talent, but you're going to need the kind of things that Logan Couture brings as well. Having said that, if someone does get him uh, prior to the trade deadline, they are going to get a player that probably, and I maybe there'll be an exception in 31 years of, of faulty memory, but they'll probably get the best playoff performer in Sharks history, um, along maybe with Pavelski. Nobody raised his game and raises his game come playoff time uh, like Logan does. He takes it to that nub that next level and produces, and you can see in the numbers, and he, and he usually drags the uh, good part of the group along with him. Well said. Absolute gamer. I respect that guy's game through and through. And, and you know what he does, Randy, too, come playoff time? He becomes a superstar. And I don't say that lightly. Like He, he is as equivalent as a superstar in the playoffs. Uh, last thing I want to ask you real quick, this franchise since its inception is knocked out of the park 
the branding of their uniforms. And now we're always seeing more and more jerseys working their way in the new color scheme this year. I am in love with the blues, the pants, everything, all the helmets, all that. Then we've got the reverse retros. Uh, the, do you have any favorites over the years and, and how are the, the most recent ones stack up for you? Well, you know, you always tend to revert back to year one and the original shark sweater, uh, was was outstanding. It was iconic. Uh, I remember, and they were leading the NHL in, in uh, merchandise sales for their first two or three years in the league. It was that popular. I remember Princess Diana going up a, a ski lift uh, with, with her sons, and I think it was Harry was wearing a, a San Jose Sharks ski jacket at some European ski resort. It had become that globally um, relevant. So that's probably the all-time favorite because it goes back to year one. But I'll tell you, with these new ones, I love the all-teal. Uh, that one just pops, and that's the home sweater, although they wore it the other night in L.A. because the Kings went reverse retro, which is a primarily white sweater. So the teal against their white was absolutely stunning. But the the new reverse retro, which which is a little bit of a stretch because it's really a reverse retro from the old Oakland Seals, uh, sweater, not the original shark sweater, but we'll give them that uh, poetic license. I think it's outstanding. Uh, you know, I have uh, sons who are 30 and 28. I gave my 30-year-old the sweater. He almost started crying when I handed it to him for his birthday. He loved it so much. And uh, I, I think they've got an absolute winner with that. Uh, and now they just need to, to put the, the bodies inside those sweaters to get things turned around. But, uh, you know, Justin Bieber uh, sent out a tweet when they debuted those reverse retro jerseys. And, and he said, my, uh, my heart will always be with the Leafs. But, uh, and I forget his, his terminology. I would screw it up if I tried to be Gen Z here. But uh, he basically endorsed the shark sweater as one of the coolest things he'd ever seen. So, Cools, I'm telling you, you need the Bieber endorsement. Uh, for the program, the the listenership will skyrocket. As it should. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, I, I'm already looking forward to your next visit. Uh, we really appreciate you being on. Uh, love your call. Uh, love how you say scores with an S, but I won't get into that right now. I, I'll, I'll save my festivus, my uh, f- grievances for Friday's show. Uh, before we let you go, Randy, and you can start working on uh, your next 2000, what do we need to know about tonight? I'm sure you got some tidbits, goalies. Give us a little Calgary San Jose 2.0. Goalies will be Markstrom versus Reimer. Nick Bonino will move up to the Sharks' top line, uh, at least for tonight, maybe the next two games, to replace the suspended Tomas Hurdle. Matt Nieto moves back up to the left wing with the Logan Couture line. Uh, Oscar Lindblom will be back in the lineup for the Sharks. Mario Ferraro returns to the blue line after a 10-game absence. Uh, for the Flames, there's a chance that Richie gets back in. Tanev may come in. They had an optional, so we're not sure. And it is the broadcaster's nightmare because we have Lindblom versus Lindholm. And my goal is to not screw that up too many times. You never do, my friend. You never do. Uh, thanks for doing this. Have a great show tonight. You know we'll be watching those of us with the bags under our eyes who are always up late enjoying Sharks hockey. Team 22 when they entered the NHL in 91 and 92. Randy, thank you for this. Happy holidays. Happy Hanukkah.